Hello and welcome once again to a question of law. Now this is CTTV's legal education program and on this show we seek to break down the law as it pertains to our daily activities in our lives and uh, you know the show is interactive. We definitely want to hear from you, hear what you think about what's going on on the show. Use the hashtag a question of law on all social media platforms. The WhatsApp line is 0550-585832. Let's take a short break. We'll be right back and we'll get into some conversations. <music> Welcome back. Now, I have my guests seated, and it's been a while since I've seen them, and so we're very excited to have them here. Salam Adonu, who is a private legal practitioner, as well as Clement Kujo Akapam, also a private legal practitioner, as well as a senior law lecturer at the uh, Gimpa Faculty of Law. Gentlemen, welcome. Thank you, Chris. It's good to see you. It's been, it's, been, it's been a while. It's been, it's been a while. <laughs> we left you in the evil hands of Pele. Yeah, Pele and, and Albert. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no. All right. So, um, in the last you know few days, we we've seen um, you know the e levy having been passed, and then also the minority uh, saying that um, we don't agree with um, certain things that happen, and so we're requesting the Supreme Court uh, you know, to put an injunction on the implementation of the e-levy. Uh, where are we? What are the legalities surrounding this? Is it, is it something that's moot? Is it, do they have a case? Um, you know, uh, yesterday, because I, I heard on, on, on an eyewitness news, um, uh, 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 Kujitua Blackwa was okay. asked you know, regarding the he said, oh, was the injunction, well, was the, the, um, they've, they've successfully filed um, for the injunction um, against the implementation, then it, it should hold, it should prevent any implementation. Um, Mario Sander said, look, there are other sides to this. Some people see that it's not necessarily the way it, you're saying it, but he, was, he, said, he sounded very convinced. What does the law actually say you know, on, on this matter? Well, um, so, so I think it's an interlocutory injunction just into place on the process. Mm -hmm. It's within their rights to do. And so there's a substantive action. Before you come in with such interlocutory matters, there should be a substantive suit upon which the interlocutory will be, will be built. So the substantive suit is that they are in the Supreme Court seeking a declaration that the passage of the, uh, the, the e-levy was unconstitutional and therefore null and void. And the crux of the argument really is that the law was not passed in accordance with the Constitution, mm. which is the bigger law. And mind you, the Constitution says that any law which is inconsistent with the Constitution yeah. to the extent of the incons in inconsistency is null and void. So the point they are seeking to make is that the e-levy, which is a law, because before you tax people, you yeah. must pass a law yeah, to enable that. you to do so. Yeah. The e levy which is a law, is being passed inconsistent with the constitution. Mm. And what exactly do they mean by that? They are talking about, about quorum. They are talking about Article 1041, I think. And they are of the view that the Parliament of Ghana did not have the required quorum. And we've discussed quorum here many times. 138, mm -hmm. you know, which is um, half of, or which is supposed to be half of 275, yes. you know. There are arguments to that, that at the time the decision was passed, it wasn't supposed to be 125. It was supposed to be 17. It wasn't supposed to be 275. It was supposed to be 274 because at the time, the uh, high court decision against the MP, the Asinov MP, yes. Jesse Quasin, was in operation. There was nothing holding it, you know, in abeyance or whatever. So that operated to mean that he was not a member of parliament at the time. Mm. That we will have to look at a bit later. So they are saying that there was no quorum because the minorities had left the hall, that's the, the chamber, that's the argument, that they left the, the chamber. And so in the same way that when they purported to reject the budget, mm. the majority was out, and so they did not have the 138, and so that decision 
was rescinded, the same thing should apply, especially as the Supreme Court in the Justice Abdullah case has made it clear that quorum was supposed to be a certain number, etc. So they are calling on the Supreme Court to look at its own judgment in the Abdullah case, which came about a month or a few weeks ago, mm -hmm. to rule on this. And they are convinced that on the basis of the Ab Justice Abdullah decision, they, they, they have a case. So now that matter is in the Supreme Court. They filed the initial processes. I've not seen the statement of case, etc., from the other side, being the Attorney General side. And as lawyers would do, or as parties would do in cases, when you think that your interest in the subject matter will be affected negatively yeah. or, or adversely, the law allows you to come in with some, uh, we call it injunction. They, they are interlocutory matters. They are not conclusive or they are not, uh, they are not permanent. So it is for the time being. Mm. So what they are seeking to do is okay. to stop the government, in this case the GRA, which mm -hmm. is the implementing agency of government in terms of tax matters, yeah. to stop them from implementing the e-levy, which we understand will start from 1st of May. Yeah. So their point is that if they are not stopped or injuncted, their interest would have been adversely affected. Mm -hmm. All right, so that's what the case really is. But the refusal or grant of injunctions is not in... It, 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 it follows certain conditions or guidelines. Okay. And, and the authorities are quite uh, conclusive on that. I mean, settled on that. So, for example, uh, there should be a serious question to be tried. Okay. There should be a serious question to be tried. The matter shouldn't be frivolous. I mean, it shouldn't be vexatious. There should be a serious question to be tried on the face of the, the affidavit or the pleadings. It should be quite apparent that this is what you are dealing with. And that you should also suffer irreparable damage or injury if the action is continued, if the, action, if the party is not stopped from you know, doing the action. Yeah. It should cause you irreparable damage. And that we will have to understand what irreparable damage, damage is. will mean to yeah, the plaintiffs because they, argue, they argue that they will be caused irreparable damage and millions of Ghanaians will also be caused irreparable damage if the implementation is not stopped mm. before the, uh, the detem final determination of the case. What it also means is that if the implementation goes ahead, what does it, the question is what does it mean for the case? Because the case is seeking to declare the law upon which the GRA and the government will be uh, uh, operating, uh, operating mm. null and void. So if they go ahead, what does it mean for their case? Does it mean that their case becomes horrendous, their case nuggetary? These are all decisions or determinations that the Supreme Court will have to make. They will have to also look at what we call the balance of convenience. Will it be inconveniencing for the, 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 the state or the plaintiffs if they go ahead and implement it, what will it be? Mm -hmm. The Supreme Court will have to weigh the advantages and disadvantages of whatever action there is to be taken for the plaintiffs and the, the, the defendants in this case yeah. to see where the balance of convenience will lie. The Supreme Court will have to do all of these, and when they do all of these, and I mean, they'll have to make a determination where the scales will tilt. If it tilts for the plaintiffs, then it means that they will have to injunct the process. If it doesn't, then the process will have to continue. But, but I raise an important point about yeah. the filing of the, 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 the process, the, the motion for interlocutory injunction. It, it's, it's been a debate in legal circles. It's, it's almost like it depends on who the judge is because the authorities have not been very settled mm. on this. In some other cases, like stay of execution, that one is quite settled. If you file a stay of execution, for example, uh, it's, it's, it's almost settled that you cannot go ahead with execution. But when it comes to still proceedings and injunctions, there are two schools of thought. One school of thought thinks that, in case of injunctions, that you filing the application or the process doesn't necessarily injunct the process. Yes. You know, it has to be moved and the matter will have to be determined on its merits. The second school of thought also thinks that once you have filed it automatically injuncts the party you are seeking to stop from continuing doing what you know you want them to stop doing so uh, my one of the reasons why i am happy about this particular one is that i hope 
that it will settle the law. Mm. I hope that when they look at it, it will settle the law where really we should be going. Whether the filing of the process automatically will stop the, 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 the action you are trying to stop yeah. or it has to be heard on this merit. And as lawyers, we, we use it as and when or depending on where we stand. Decide, decide so when, when we are on the side that wants to continue working and there's a suit against us, we use the, the authorities to, to, to buttress our point. When we find ourselves on the other side seeking to injunct the other side, then we, we go for the other argument. So this, I think, should bring some clarity and, and, and finality on this particular part of the law. Yeah, and also a um, quick, quick one. I was, I'm just hoping that the Supreme Court will take advantage and, and give us clarity on mm -hmm. this. But, I mean, even before that, and with the explanation that Selom just gave on how lawyers will use um, such processes, yeah. I will, I am more, um, I tilt more towards the fair school that says okay. that the mere filing does not stop the process. And the reason is that as lawyers, it's an application I can file. And then once the intention or the acceptance is that the mere filing stops the process, I will file it, a time frame is given mm. within which the application will be moved and heard. Yeah. On the day of moving the application, once I've achieved what I wanted to achieve within yeah. that time frame, I will withdraw it. Mm. So that process of filing and withdrawing okay. applications, I okay. think that the mere filing should not operate as a mm. state. The application should be moved head on its merits and a decision made. One point to add to uh, the brilliant explanation by Salom is that this whole determination of an injunction application is discretionary. So the court will have to look, yes, there are guidelines, but ultimately it's at the discretion of the bench or it's at the discretion of the judge mm. to make a determination um, based on the, the principles that Salom um, put out there. My little... Um, issue is why are we not having this earlier mm. before okay. the implementation of the um, of the law on the first of of, 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 of of May. First of May being a holiday, the next available working day is the fourth. So is this something that we could have had this application mm. earlier? Yeah. So also to give the government a certain indication of whether they are going ahead or they are waiting. I mean mm. if there's an application that was filed at the High Court, I mean three days is enough notice okay. so if this was filed yesterday up until the fourth but this is the supreme court i mean they have other matters they are dealing with so i mean we're hoping that on the fourth we'll get we'll get clarity to this but okay. um quickly full stop on this the applicants mm. in this um, injunction have used the fact that the mere filing does not stop the process yes. Yes. in relation to the justification case mm -hmm. okay so now they are also in a position now where they will hope that okay. the mere filing will stop the process. Okay. So that's the point that Selom makes. Mm. And I think that we will need to get clarity. And I think that the mere filing should not operate as an injunction. You must hear the application. Okay. Also because it's a discretionary um, relief that has to be granted. So that on its merits, the, yeah. the, the court will make it. So, so let me make an interesting point on, on what he, he, he thinks should be. For example, the, the mere filing shouldn't stop it. I, I think that that will be a huge task for the Supreme Court to make, really, because there are instances where, in fact, the mere filing should actually stop it because of the pendency of the thing that is to happen. So, for example, if because when you file, sometimes it's not within your 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 power to determine when the matter will be heard. Mm -hmm. So, when when something very serious to you, damaging to you, is about to happen and you file the injunction, in that case, you'll be hoping that the mere filing will stop it because the, the return date for which you move the application for it to be heard is not within your reach. It's not, it's not within your power. So, for example, so, so we, we are thinking that in this particular matter, we think the return date should have been earlier so that the matter I said before the first. Okay. But in this case, it, it was not within the powers of the applicants mm. to so determine. Okay. So... I, I think that there will be a, there should be a very well reasoned decision, and the fact that it's discretionary, like Clement rightly said, so the discretionary power sh is not exercised in a vacuum. Right. So, so two nine six, for example, tells us Article two nine six, for example, tells us how that discretionary power must be exercised. It must not be arbitrary. You know. So I think, I I, I think that it will be, 
a very important decision mm. for the Supreme Court to make in respect of it. Because clearly and objectively speaking, there are times that filing it should actually injunct the process in the meantime. Yes. And there are times to where filing should not. Okay. Uh -huh. So I, I wonder how the Supreme Court <laughs> will, will, will make that, that, that balance. In give, fact. Be, before we move on to the conversation, just give us a sort of like a, a, an idea so that viewers can understand. When you say there are some processes that just the mere filing will stop or should stop the process. So, so um, the, the in, processes, yeah. I mean, so, so we use process in a technical sense. Okay. So, so for example, if it's a state of execution, mm. oftentimes execution, you finish the matter, there's a final judgment or there's a judgment. It may not be final, but there's a judgment. You want to execute. You want to uh, benefit from or enjoy the fruit of the judgment. There's a process to, to, to doing that. You, you, you have to enter the judgment. You have to uh, decide which execution process you are using. Whether you're going by Ghana. I mean, you have to de determine which process you're using. Mm. Once that is done, the judgment has been executed. So what are you then going to fight? So that's why it's important that the, so in the judge question case, for example, they filed a stay of execution, and that really operated as a stay even before the hearing of the application. Because if that was not the case, and that execution could continue whilst the application was pending, then the seat could have been declared vacant. Then where, does that, where, where would that put him then mm. if the appeal process... I mean, if it's successful with the appeal process, would we have to come back and, and undo that mm -hmm. when it's been declared vacant and, and maybe a new MP is even being elected because okay. the case could travel you yeah. know, a little far, yeah. so, uh, or, or a little into the future or further? So that's one. In terms of injunctions, so for example, somebody is about to demolish your house. Yeah. Somebody is about to demolish your house for whatever reason. You can file a suit quickly and then file an injunction. Hmm hoping to injunct that process. Maybe you just got wind of the fact that they will come demolish the place tomorrow or two days later. You quickly set in place the legal processes trying to injunct that. If the filing of the injunction should not operate as stay, then they will go ahead and demolish your house. Okay. They will go ahead and demolish your house and do whatever they want to do with mm -hmm. the place. Mm -hmm. And one of the things that to be considered before granting injunction is that compensation will not be enough. Mm. And when it comes to land matters, because of the very nature of land, etc., which I think we'll, we'll delve into we'll delve soon, into it, yeah. compensation may not necessarily be enough because mm. there are other things attached to land and no two lands are the same. So the person goes ahead and demolishes your house and it's going to cost you a lot of inconvenience. Take time before a similar house could be put up again for you. So in that case, it's, it's easier to say that the filing of the injunction should operate as a stay until the hearing of the application. So in that case, for example, so we say if we say the law should, should be that once you file, it doesn't stay it, then they will break your house mm. before the injunction yeah, but, is heard. But Salam, that's and, not the only avenue you can use to stop them from breaking. Of the course. injunction is yes. not the only avenue. There are other avenues you can also engage. You can engage the services of the, of the police service to stop any action. Because if I am... Yes. yes. So it's not the injunction is using the civil process if i'm in my house and someone comes says he's going to demolish my house mm. in two days mm. and i issue a writ and i know i have two days and the mere filing of um an injunction application will not stop the process there are other avenues you can trigger okay. to stop that okay. i and i totally agree with him and as lawyers we play both sides all the time and I've pointed out to you where, in one breath, <laughs> the applicants in this case are playing a side, and in this breath, they are hoping to play another side. That's okay. why we need clarity and we need okay. a position okay. uh, on this, and I'm hoping that we can get that clarity. It's a very difficult task for the Supreme Court to try and achieve within the time and what we are expecting them to do. But I, 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 I think that because of how it's been used mm. and in the context of land, we need to find ways yeah. of, of deciding whether we want injunctions to operate immediately. Mm. And then the next is a slew of injunction applications yeah. just to stop happen. everything. So, so that, that that, also, that's the downside. That, that disadvantage is also okay. there. So we need to study this. An interesting thought just came to mind. So like uh, the irreparable damage, or the damage cost, for example. Mm. So the, the applicants are 
arguing that the implementation of it will cause them damage. But, but I've not seen the states, you know, affidavit in opposition. Okay. But we know that, I can't say the court will take judicial notice. I can't say so because <laughs> of the judgments are, uh, case, because of the economic matters. Yeah. I can't say that, the, uh, or maybe could it also be said by the Attorney General that not implementing it could cause the economy damage yeah. because we, we heard that if this is not passed, mm. the economy may collapse. Up, yeah. You know, so yeah. so I don't know where the Supreme Court will really okay. you know, tilt its 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 decision, but that'll be interesting, interesting to know. Ahead. Well, let's take a short break. We'll be right back with some more conversations on a question of law. City TV is live on DSTV. Go to channel 363. On Go TV, access City TV on channel 182. On a digital TV, please press the menu button on the remote control and run a new search on your TV. Take note that without an antenna, you cannot access City TV on your television. City TV can be accessed on a free to air digital box like the Go TV and Star Times box. City TV, it's your world. Welcome back. It's still a question of law. Everyone is getting into some other conversations. Um, now, we'll talk about land. Now, I'm sure um, those of you who are watching us, you've had some kind of engagement, you know, one way or another, as far as land issues are concerned. And in Ghana, it can be pretty troubling for a lot of people. We want to find out who actually owns lands in Ghana. Uh, the government owns some lands, the chiefs own some lands, their families own some lands. So it can become a bit murky sometimes. Well, let's get into the conversation. Um, Clement. Yes, good. Who owns lands, really, as far as the Constitution so, is concerned? So, we are just coming yeah. from the back of Easter. Yeah. Let me give you an interesting I mean, <laughs> Holy Saturday yeah. for us Catholics. One okay. of the readings we take mm. will be the reading when the Israelites were led through the Red Sea yes. to the Promised Land. Yeah. Now, remember, when they got onto the Promised Land, mm. There were people on the promised land. land already. What did God tell them to do? Well, you have to get rid of everybody. Yeah, so they sent people, yeah. to, then they got rid of them. Yes. So one way of getting land mm. is through conquest. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah. So you conquer a people yeah. and take over their land. So historically, through wars mm. and through conquest, you become the owner. Because once I defeat you, yeah. I take Everything your that's goods, yours. Everything yeah. that belongs to you, yeah. and including the land mm. on which. So you become an owner of land as an individual, a family, a group, mm. a state through conquest. That's one way of owning land. Yeah. Another way of owning land that is only reserved for the state is through compulsory acquisition. Okay. So for certain purposes the state can trigger what we call their eminent domain right mm. to acquire land. So it can be your land as Kweku David, but the state needs that land, land for a certain public good. I see. They will compulsorily acquire that land, but then you are paid compensation okay. for the state taking your land. Okay. So that's another way. Then the, the most common way of becoming an owner of land that everyone jointly mm. as an individual or families or clans is through purchase mm. or a sale so in that someone has land meaning that the person is the owner and the person gives you a right or an interest in there through a transaction of okay. sale so you can acquire land through mm. conquest become an owner through conquest, through sale, and for the state, through compulsory acquisition. Now, 
just to come, just mm. to buttress that point a bit. So, um, conquest. So, in the olden days, uh, there, there was discovery. You can discover the land as a group. You know, mm. in those days, hunters go deep into the land, etc., into bushes, and they discover land. So <laughs> that, Columbus. yes, you know, so <laughs> that could be a way of of. Of I mean, they say that even in modern times, you know, so it, you it can could, still do that. It, it could know? happen. Only that, yeah, um, they, I don't know if they are undiscovered land. <laughs> I, I don't know. I don't know. So um, there, there's, you can also become an owner of land mm. by it's being gifted to you by yeah. by by gifts. And so, like Clement said, by purchase or sale as well. Mm. So so primarily, there are four major. According to Ohimen and Ajay, which is the case, we have four. The conquest, that Clement rightly said. We have discoveries, we have um, sale or gifts, you know, and, and the legislative part is what he started talking about mm -hmm. in terms of the uh, exercise of the eminent domain of the state by compulsorily acquiring the land. Yes. Yeah. So, I mean, Salom made a point when we were discussing the e levy that no two lands are the same mm. because you can have land and the interest thereof might be different so yeah. someone might have land and he will have will be holding an interest as an allodial owner okay and when you say we, you are an allodial owner mm -hmm. it means that it's the highest form of interest you can have in land mm -hmm. you have you have the alum the property belongs to you you don't have any service rights to anybody so you are the ultimate owner no. So that's the best form of ownership that you can you, you can you can have in, in in land and if you look at the the recent land act it gives credence to um allodial ownership okay so then by way of hierarchy if you are looking at the highest interest in land mm. at the top will be your allodial interest okay. so this is the highest form then you can have what we call freeholds so a freehold is also an interest which is permanent, it is absolute, it is inheritable, you can transact on it, mm. but you hold it subject to the allodial. So okay. you, that interest will be carved out for you. Now the freehold okay. can either be um, a customary freehold, mm. meaning that you got that freehold under customary law, okay. or a common law freehold which means a freehold gutting under common law. Now, all these are will sound a bit technical, but what it means, these freeholds, even with the passage of the New Land Act, there have been um, limitations since, I think, 1962, that you can no longer create a customary freehold mm -hmm. in particular um, okay. types of land, family land, school lands, or clan lands. You cannot create freeholds. So a freehold is also an interest. Then a leasehold, which is also a carved out interest, giving you a definite yes mm. in land. So if I have land and I have a freehold, I can give you, Kweku David, 90 year lease okay. from my freehold. Okay. Now, the one who takes the lease can also give a sub lease okay. of 60 years. Okay. So, determining the interest you hold in land. It's very important to what you enjoy and what you can do with the land. Mm. Because if you have a leasehold for 90 years, you cannot give it out to another person for 90 years because yeah. your limited duration mm. is for 90 years. So when it comes to land, it's like any other property. The one who is giving it out to you must be the owner and must have the capacity. Okay. So you can be the owner, yeah. but you might not have capacity. How is that? So capacity is given to you by the law. Now capacity okay. says that you must have attained a certain age and must have a certain state of mind to be able to enter into a contract. So if you look at the, the, the Land Act, mm. the age of majority to transact in land is 18 years. Okay. Now some of us have issues with this because Another entity that can acquire interest in land is a company. Uh -huh. mm -hmm. But you cannot, under the Companies Com Act, set up a company yeah. if you are not um, 20, 20, 21. 21. Mm -hmm. So how do you marry this? But that's for another day. Yeah. So with 18 years, you can buy land, you can be sued, and you can sue in a transaction on land. 
So it means you have capacity. But if you are 15 year old and your father has gifted land to you, mm. you are the owner, but you lack capacity to transact on I that see. because you don't, yeah, 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 below 18 years. So capacity and ownership goes in tandem to transfer. And it's mm. very important because you cannot, the, the, the general principle of law when it comes to property law is that you cannot give what you do not have. That's the principle of Nemo Dat. Okay. So if you do not own it, if I sell it to you, you don't get anything. And that's what we see where people will buy land mm. from persons who did not have the capacity to sell. To sell. Yeah. So now they will have to go and transact with the rightful owners. And yeah. then you will either buy mm. your land twice or thrice, yeah. paying different people yeah. depending on... I actually have a case like that. Mm. Uh, you, you bought you bought land from. I bought land in Winnipeg. Uh, I think you, 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 you should. Why, why come, are you? Oh, you should come so we it's talk properly. Yeah, you've given oh, you've given up on the land. Oh, you should see Clement. Pay something small, and he'll retrieve the land for you. He'll reclaim it for you. Maybe, maybe, maybe. I should maybe I should still look into it. So, but how long has it been? You know, so the period it's you know the other party occupying the land. It's also important. Okay. God, mm. You cannot really go back for the land because. So, so here, let me tell you, let me describe what happened. So here's the thing. Um, one, I went to a chief's home yes. to have a conversation with the chief. Yes. Right. Now, the person who we spoke to, we didn't know he wasn't the chief. Mm. He was a relative okay. of the chief. And so he goes ahead and, you know, acts as the chief with, on, without us knowing that he's we're dealing with the wrong person. So then he goes ahead and then you know what he does? He, we agree to, to buy the land. We've talked everything else. And then he prepares the indentures for us and everything. So when we come to sign, he actually signs his full name in two parts. So he has... Fanti names, two Fanti names and two English names. Okay. So he uses the two English names as one person mm -hmm. and the two Fanti names as another person. It's a fraudulent person. Did you, did you know that? Or does we did, no, we this is after the fact. This is after the fact. I mean, two or three years after the fact that we discovered that we had been dealing with the wrong person, you know, and all of that. Eventually, I mean, it was just too much back and forth and I didn't engage a lawyer. So, oh, so actually, for, for, for our viewers, yeah. um, at the Ghana Police Service, the property fraud, fraud unit. Yeah. Okay. Because of all these things that happen with land, okay. there's a very vibrant unit okay. at the Ghana Police Service where you can lodge some of these complaints. Mm. And the, when you go there this morning, you see chiefs, mm. yeah. you see <laughs> clan heads because they've been, wow. you see land guards. Wow. Because these things, you obviously, you must report to the mm. police because mm. they are. Parts that are criminal, yeah. and your interest, your civil mm. interest, that you will want to retrieve oh, by way yeah. of the money you yeah. need. So that's a place where mm. to start, even without the assistance of a lawyer, mm. having an issue with land, you should pay a visit to the property fraud unit of the Ghana Police mm. um, Service, mm. and they will start the process. A yeah. lot of things have ended there because they will ask you to bring your documents, mm. you to bring your documents. Yeah. So once the documents are produced, yeah. there and then they are able to tell. Who mm -hmm. has yeah. the right documents? If yeah. they are not able to tell, they advise the parties. Yeah. This matter can only be resolved when you go to court. Yeah. So then you can move a next step to, yeah. to, to, to go into court. So, so in that case, maybe we are jumping ahead of ourselves, but in that case, if your due diligence was not spot on, mm. you, 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 you had to do better due diligence, which is a whole thing on its own. If so, so what happened was that we actually sent the documents as we received them to keep Coast, because this was these lands we were bought in whenever. Right. So Cape Coast to go and do land search and all of that. Yeah, so, so, so that's one of them. Mm -hmm. But even before you, you paid or did anything, yeah. I mean, who the chief is should not be a secret. It's, it's, it's a known fact. It's a notorious fact mm. or should be a notorious fact in the community who the chief is. Mm. And, and so I think you could have done a lot more work on to, 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 make to know sure who the chief is. The, you know. So yeah. without that, so for example, I, I'm, I'm not sure if... You, with this, you will qualify for a bona fide purchase of value without notice. Because there are things you ought to have done, mm. which you did not do. 
and so the law or equity cannot operate. I mean, it's over to, 15 to, years to, to ago, help so I'm not particularly yeah, so, worried I mean, about it. The, the statute of you are, you are, you are, you are statute yeah. badly. Yeah. No, but we, we make a lot of some some of these mistakes. Mm. You are. You, you don't you don't buy land like Kinky. Okay. Mm -hmm. <laughs> like to make yeah. no, no, it's yeah. not. <laughs> because this is is landed property. Yeah. It's scarce mm. and it's expensive. Yeah. So you don't just go and buy it. Mm. And in a part of the world it's complicated. Yes. Yeah. And this because you can be buying from a family. Within that family, there's a family head. Mm -hmm. okay. Who is the rightful person mm. to lead the transaction? Okay. But you might be dealing with a, a nephew or a niece. Yeah. Because who, he posed as a family head. Mm. Exactly. But apparently he wasn't even. even yeah. that. You might be dealing with um, an individual who is fronting for someone. So mm. immediately you decide that you're interested in a certain piece of land. There are certain steps. You must mm. The first thing is to just know, even from neighbors. Mm. You go that, onto the land, yeah. check with adjoining yeah. neighbors okay. who owns this property. Yeah. Oh, they'll tell you it's Mr. A. Oh, we know him. And if I know a piece of land that was left untouched for 30 years in a Whoa. prime location Whoa. and no one could touch it, okay. the entire neighborhood knew was who. developed. Okay. So that's even the red So when you go there, immediately you go there on that land, the owner of the land who doesn't live in that community mm -hmm. immediately is informed because the neighbors know him and they'll ask have you sent someone to the land yeah so if you are going to buy such a land <laughs> the neighbors are your first yeah. point of call yeah. now you'll be giving documents you ask for documents when you are buying land mm -hmm. that's why i say it's not kinky yeah kinky you don't ask for any documents no. once it's <laughs> no receipts no once it's <laughs> actually selling the kinky we are good to go but you ask for documents the documents will show you names there'll be a site plan there'll be an mm -hmm. indenture it will show the type of ownership yeah the type of interest we are talking about okay then now you move the step to do a search because the documents you, you'll be holding mm. might be documents that have been um discarded documents that have been cancelled by them okay. so you do an extensive okay. search mm. and if you engage lawyers it's easier but you can also do it as an in, as an individual okay. you go to the lands commission you do a search today under the um, lands act they are customary land secretariat where you can also do a search to mm. find so searches are conducted mm. not only at the land you do a search also at the court to find out if the land is a subject matter of litigation mm. now we have a collateral registry okay you have to do a search there as well because for all you know that land you are going to buy has been used as collateral <laughs> for a loan <laughs> wow so if you don't go through all yeah. these processes you will buy land yeah and you would have bought no land good. on paper and that's what we tell people. Most of the time, what we do is that we buy land on paper. Yeah. On the ground, you don't have land. You don't own the land. And that's where the problems are. So wow. there's due diligence that you must do mm. as a purchaser. Mm. And once you've gone through all these processes, then the law will protect you as an innocent purchaser. Okay. Because you've done what a reasonable person that's should do done. if yeah. you are going to part with yeah. money okay. for property. Okay. But if you just go there... They only take you there on Sundays. Yeah. You should be wary. <laughs> Why can't we go on the land yeah. Yeah. on weekdays? Yeah. It's a red flag. Yeah. Okay. When you are going there, you are only sitting in the car and they are, they are, they pointing. are pointing. That is it. That is it. They don't get down. Should be a red flag. So okay. there are certain things. I mean, there are places that when you buy the land, they are telling you to bring the money in cash. Yeah. It's a red it's a flag. Red flag. Because immediately they take it so after that meeting yeah. when you come back and you yeah, say there's oh, no money left it's gone it's gone <laughs> like they'll use yeah. cutlass <laughs> to be they, they, they use some to do funerals <laughs> the following yes. Saturday, then they'll go and get put to sixty thousand gold yeah. too yeah. and then they'll just finish yeah. it's gone yeah. you won't find it yeah. so even the mode of payment so once you do your due diligence on the documents you move to the next stage on making sure that the right interest mm. is conveyed to you yeah and when it comes to land the technical term is conveyance it's conveyed to okay. you so what documents are they preparing for you mm. people have bought land and said we oh this land i bought it mm. <laughs> but what you have is a lease okay because if you read the document you have definite years so it means you didn't buy it you have a lease have leased it. if you bought it your document will show that the person has assigned all his rights to you so due diligence before 
and then being very open-minded at the point of document preparation mm. who is signing and even the doc if you are buying from a family it should be signed in a meeting of the family mm. where there are witnesses persons you can point to yeah but if they will sign and bring it to you to mm. sign now we like convenience everything is e, e. yeah so they'll sign an email to you it's yeah. okay <laughs> you buy the land on paper. By the time you go there, there's no land. But if you are buying family land, yeah. at the, on the day of signing, there should be a certain yeah. ceremony of a sort. For customary law, there used to be ceremonies. Mm. But now it's not important. Those ceremonies are not important. But it served a certain purpose so that the community will know mm. that on this day we all met and this portion of land, yeah, was this so type of interest yeah. was given to this person. And it protects your purchase so due diligence due diligence due diligence at every step of the purchase mm. otherwise you end up with litigation stress and tears wow <laughs> very very, very uh, exhausting yeah. i mean so so um i don't even know where to take it from uh, so so who, who owns land i mean that, that was your question which, yeah. which which led clement to, to go all out i mean the uh, lodo and, and bj darocha have said that the person who owns land is the one who is able to prove either by himself or by his grantors. The grantor is the person who gives you the land mm. or who sells the land to you. And you become the grantee mm. that himself or the grantor, you know, have been in possession of the land, the subject matter for a long time, mm. such that there will be no reasonable owner anywhere else. Okay. You understand? Okay. So when you get your indenture, there's what we call the root of title. Mm -hmm. The root of title on the indenture should help you able to trace the source of the land okay maybe you got a land from a family or a student etc so like clement said in passing we, we land can be owned by the stool or a community mm. which is represented by the stool land could be owned by a family and in some cases individuals yeah the state properly so-called the political state can actually own a land by the exercise of the uh, eminent domain compulsory acquisition if government wants to undertake a project, for example, and it wants this particular part of mm -hmm. town, it is able to compulsorily acquire that through law, legislation. Mm -hmm. It's able to compulsorily acquire that. Mm -hmm. It does so by uh, 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 an executive instrument. Yeah. And there should be adequate compensation <clears throat> paid the owners of the people, okay. you know, the owners of the land. Mm. So, for example, government wants to put up a secondary school. There's no ownerless land. Mm. Every land has an owner. Mm. But government wants to put up the secondary school in this particular area. There are owners of that land. It could yeah. be a family, it could yeah. be a student, it could be individuals. Government must look for those people, talk to them, and compensate them for the land it is taking away. Mm. If after a while, government decides not to undertake the project again, and so government wants to give out the land, government must deal with those people first. Okay. To see if they are still interested Fresh in their choice. land, yeah. yes, be before others can come in. Okay. So if you realize there were issues some time back about some lands at La, the mm, AU mm. village, and yes. a whole lot of things, yes. those were the matters. Right. So a family can give you land, a stool can give you land, and an inv individual can also give you land. Mm. So it's important that at every stage, you you know exactly who who is giving mm. you the land. Okay. There are times that some families are like stools, but you should. You should be careful to know whether it's a stool giving you the land yeah, or, or it's a family, family you know and and for each of them mm. the, the the requirements of what you must do may be different and in certain parts of the country it's 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 obviously a stool mm. like in the Akan areas it's mm. it's mostly a stool okay in the ga and ewa areas you can have families mm, as well um, yeah. or even individuals in mm. some cases in the northern part of the country, we have the persons we call the Tindanes. Yeah. The Tindanes are like the earth priest or the land priest. Mm. They do so on behalf of the chiefs, etc. Okay. And, and in those cases, you don't have stools, you have skin. Okay. You know, so, so it's important. So after you've done all that Clement has talked about, the due diligence, etc., and you now have the land, in our part of the world, you having the land doesn't mean that you must mm. take steps to possess the land. Okay. And occupy it, do okay. something on the land mm. that will show your presence on the land. Okay. Because we see that possession is nine out of ten of mm. ownership. Mm. So if you buy a land, you leave the land there, somebody else comes, also buys it from another source, you know, and he occupies the place, mm. you know, till a certain time. Yeah. When you, you, you go to court, one of the first things the court will want to find out is 
who has possession. Mm. And, and the one who has possession has a better title. Okay. Except, you know, against, uh, he, has, he has good title, except against the one with a better title. Right. Wow. You know, so possession is important. So somebody buys a land, he leaves the land just like that because yeah. in his mind he's bought a land. Yeah. It may be genuine, but you may run into trouble and you may end up in court for several years. There are land cases we, we, which are still in court and mm. it's been many, many, many years. You don't want to go into that. You know, when, when, when you look at the land administration system yeah. of our country, for mm. example, one of the key problems has to do with boundary disputes. Okay. And, and, and I think one of the labs, I don't know whether lab two, lab, lab one or lab two, was trying to deal with the issue of boundary ownership. So the issue about problems in land purchases, some could be due to genuine disputes mm. about boundaries, mm. and others could be mere criminal or, or, or shared yeah. criminal activities. Boundary disputes. So yeah. some areas like the Oyarefa Pantan mm. areas, there are a number of families there who genuinely think that they have land. Mm. So, so, so um, I just don't want to mention families. You know, they genuinely think they have land because yeah. the boundary lines have been bled. Yeah. So this family thinks that its boundary extends to this place. Yeah. The other parties will think its, farm, its boundary extends it's to the other place. Right, so they yeah. go ahead and sell. Mm. So it is only when you see the document, the proper document, and you go deep, deep and look into the source documents that you realize that no, it's this other family. Mm. But because of development and other things, okay. now a lot of these boundary lines have been blurred. Okay. And that really is, is a big, big problem. Yeah. You know? All right. We, we, we can go. You know, we'll definitely have to do you know, another part of this conversation on land. But we need to take a short break. Let's do that. We'll come back and up next will be the docket. All right, welcome back. It's time for the docket. Now, this is the segment of the show uh, where we take your issues regarding uh, your challenges that you're having and we try and give a bit of legal education to help you through. Now, this one is interesting because it's actually about land as well. So we're going to get into right right now. And it says here, um, is there a law that regulates squatting or squatters in Ghana? I'm asking because a friend of mine has recently gotten a major issue uh, with some people who have been squatting on his land. My friend bought land around the Dowenya side of town, fenced it, and traveled for about 10 years. Before leaving, he left the land in the care of someone. The person proceeded to lease the land to squatters who have been living there all these years. He's now back in town and wants to develop the land. But unfortunately, the person he left the land with has passed on. And someone who doesn't know my friend has taken charge of the land. Though my friend has all the land documents intact in his name, the squatters have refused to leave with the claim that they have been paying rent to the deceased man for years and also to the new in charge. All attempts to reason with the new person in charge have proven futile. He wants my friend to compensate him and all the other squatters first if he truly wants the land back. I want to know if this is legal. If it's not, how can the law help him? <laughs> that, that, that's an interesting one. So, yes. um, if, if I got everything right, a number mm. of important things in there. Somebody bought the land and trusted it into somebody's hands yeah. and traveled for 10 years. Mm -hmm. You know, almost like a biblical story where <laughs> so somebody, uh, a master of traveling, gave them talent, gave and, them talent and left yeah. and came back later. So, um, and left for 10 years. Mm. I mean, the number of years is important mm. because of uh, limitation issues, okay. the statute of limitation. Okay. I mean, but he fenced the land. He fell in the land, yes, it yes. still, it still, so still doesn't matter. He, had he, he, he did possession. something on the land. Yes. But the fact that he had a caretaker is good. Okay. So it means that he had somebody to look at the place for mm. him. But I wonder how he'll be gone for 10 years without talking to the person or without knowing, like, being in touch with the person. Yeah. So the person died along the line. He should, he should know. And, and so he should take steps to perhaps even replace the, the deceased or the dead yeah. caretaker, you know. 
So, so these are things which are important. But the caretaker, what, what time did he say rent or lease? The Lead caretaker leased le yeah. the place to some other people. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So squatters, so in, in, in the... I, I guess it's, well, he said lease, but I think it sounds more like rented it out. Yeah, so, yes. so the, the amount really doesn't matter. Yeah, exactly. I mean, once it's sufficient, the amount doesn't matter. It mustn't necessarily be adequate. Mm. Once it's sufficient, it's okay. So the amount really doesn't matter. Mm. Because that, that is... That is a whole determination of the market. I can decide to rent a plush room for you yeah. at 10 cities. Yeah. Once I'm getting consideration, mm -hmm. it is a commitment and an acknowledgement of the fact that I'm your landlord. Yeah. You know, I could take $1 million. Mm. It's still the same. The quantum may not necessarily matter yeah. in this respect. Yeah. So by agreeing to pay rent, then it means that there's a certain admission mm. that you know, the land belongs to somebody mm -hmm. and you are on that land. Yeah. You have not denied title, mm. or you have not denied the title of your landlord. Okay. So that is an important point to make. Okay. But he, le he left for 10 years, mm. and the person died. We don't know how long between the... Been dead for yes, when the new caretaker came, mm. we don't know how long they've been there. Mm. And he also went ahead to take rent from the people, etc. In any case, in any case, they've been there for a very long time. Mm. They have accrued some rights. Mm. I'm not sure if their rights would have, you know, ripened or matured or crystallized to become adverse possession. I'm not sure because of the timelines. But in any case, they have accrued some rights. And you don't just come and displace them. Okay. You, you have to, you know, resettle them in a way. You have to give them some money. You have to compensate them <clears throat> in a way. So to just come and sweep them away is not even humane. Okay. Once they have been there for a long time, you know, you were gone, they were there, and they had some right, equitable, mm. paying rent to people, etc. They have been there. So you can't just come as an owner and sweep them away. No, you have issues because they have accrued some rights. And so you must necessarily, you know, compensate or resettle them in a certain way. That mm. is, is, yeah, is, is quite yeah. interesting. I, th I think um, I agree with Salam, but from the, from the fact itself, they're mm. paying rent. Yes. So the fact of a landlord being present was there. Mm -hmm. Whether it is the owner we are talking about or right now, his agent, mm -hmm. or the in charge, yes. mm -hmm. it means there's someone who owns yes. the land. Yes. Yeah. So there is the understanding already. So I don't even think that they qualify as quarters. They are not squatters. They are not squatting. They are not okay. squatters. But I but think maybe it's, it's the way they look and the, the fact that they are, they are yes, just there. Maybe they so, yeah. put up okay. all these mm -hmm. wooden structures. Yes. Okay. But if they are technically paying they are not squatters. Rent, yeah. Yes, technically they are not squatters. Okay. So if they are not squatters and they are paying rent. Mm then it means they have a certain interest mm. or they have a right not an interest. Yeah, they, they have, have a right, right. Yeah. okay but that right does not rival the interest of the landlord so mm. i use two things right okay so you have a right to the land because you are paying rent yeah the landlord has an interest because he owns because he owns it okay you are there so if i want to even take you out of my house mm. that I'm renting to you, I must give you notice. Okay. I must serve you notice. That's give your you right. Adequate, yes. Because you have a right mm. to be there. You are not put there. Um, you are not a squatter. You mm. came in there through a certain okay. process. So I give you notice mm. and then give you time to move out. Mm -hmm. Now, if you don't respect the notice, you don't respect the time to move out, then I have to take other steps okay. to evict or eject you. Mm. As, as a landlord. But Salon makes the point on needing to compensate them. I don't think that... I, I, will, I will say that it depends on whether they are squatters or, or ten, they came in as tenants. Mm. So, 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 so there's a broken connection somewhere. W when the original caretaker died, somebody else took over. Yes. I'm not sure if there's a connection between the proper owner of the land mm -hmm. and this caretaker. Mm -hmm. So... In this case, what becomes the status of that caretaker who is unknown to the original owner? Mm. If that person is on the land for a long time, will his interest ripen into adverse possession? Right. Mm. That is uh, uh, you know, uh, an interesting part, an important thing we must recognize. So the facts are all not together. So let's put the two together. So assuming that the person was there without the knowledge of the original owner, mm, yeah. then that person who is not paying rent to the original owner, mm. but rather taking rent from other people who are third parties, mm. he could be a kind of 
a squatter of a kind because he's, okay. he's not there properly. No. He, he's benefiting from it, but he's not there properly. So I think the two scenarios, what Clement has said and, and what I've said, may come together to give an answer. But yeah. in any case, you know, you will have to look at how you want to e eject them. The law provides avenues. Mm. We'll have to look at it again properly, fitting everything together to know. In any case, you, must, you, you may need an action in law and you may have to compensate them for mm. whatever reason. You know, depending on what the, the, the detailed facts are. There's a quick advice to landowners. You don't buy land and leave it. Mm -hmm. Visit the land. Plant a mango tree. Okay. Do something to okay. show presence. But this is what we do. Mm. We buy land and we are yeah, holding we the documents and we are happy. Mm -hmm. Then you show me, oh, I have this, my <laughs> land title. But someone is building on the land. Hello? <laughs> Visit the land. Show, show it. It's land. Mm. It's not land. It's not as I tell people. And someone made the point, land is not bought on paper. Yeah. It's bought on paper, and then you exercise your rights on the land. The land. Yeah. On the land. So people should not, yes, you can buy your wall, put a, um, a lock on the gate, but if you travel and people jump over the wall and break mm. it, adverse possession might come up. So mm. every day, send someone there, so land there, or even when the people come, you know, say, we have scenarios where people have land, and they say, okay, you are here, I know you are here. So you'll be here, you know I'm the landlord, anytime, call, let's talk. But the, any day I need this land, please be ready to move there. Don't put any permanent structure mm. on the land. So mm. these are kind... So this becomes a caretaker of yes. a kind. Also, you can get somebody who will be farming on the land. Mm. There should be some presence on the sense, land, yeah. presence which is traceable mm. to you. Okay. Very necessary. Fantastic. And sometimes you want to buy a land, they show you a place, and there's a wall around the land, or it's a broken wall. Yeah. Traces show that you know, there's a broken wall yeah. or something. That's, that's dangerous. Mm. You need to find out who put around, who, who, put, put, the, the who, who put the wall there. Yeah. Because nobody will just go and put the a wall, wall anywhere. The person should really have an interest to do okay. that. You need to find out. All right. And that's somebody right. says, I have a certificate. Mm. So I'm selling the land to you. Mm. You need to find out what the source of the certificate is. Okay. It could be that the certificate has been cancelled or revoked. You should mm. do your di due diligence for to, to be All sure right. that you are buying the right thing. We, we can't exhaust this all. No, we, we can't. We have to come back. Yes, no, yes, so yes, definitely, yes. We're, we're definitely going to do when, another, when it comes to land. another <laughs> part of this a conversation on land. Uh, but it's time for us to take a look at our legal trivia. Legal trivia. Did you know that a person who gives or agrees or offers to give to a public officer a valuable consideration for the grant to that person or to any other person of a benefit or an advantage or for the exercise of influence in favor of that person or any other person commits a misdemeanor. This can be found in Section 252 of Criminal Offenses Act 1960, Act 29. Take note and do the needful. That will be all for our legal trivia today. Thank you once again for watching A Question of Law. Uh, it's been exciting conversations, and uh, we're definitely going to do a part two of this. Um, but my guests have been Salam Adonu, who is a private legal practitioner, as well as Clement Kujo Akapam, also a private legal practitioner, as well as a senior law lecturer at the Gimpa School of Law. Keep watching City TV. See you next time.